All right. How's everybody tonight? Good. Amen. By God's grace, we're here. So tonight will be our updates, and uh, we'll be talking about some end time stuff. People like that stuff, but uh, uh, not just newsworthy, but biblical worthy. Let's talk about some things of the end times. Let's pray and ask the Lord for his grace. Oh, dear Lord, we're so thankful that to be in your presence, Lord, is the best thing, to be at your feet, Lord God. It will never be taken away from us like what happened to Mary. And so, Lord, we thank you that we could be at your feet. We can hear not only the things that are going on in the world, but most importantly, Lord, things that are going on in your heart and what your heart is for this world and for the church and for the believers, Lord God, and the desire to save those who are lost, Lord God. We praise you and thank you that... Your heart is for those who seek you, Lord God. You're not too far from those who want to hear the truth, Lord God. You're not too far, but our sins have kept us from you, Lord. So we pray, Lord God, we would come to you to be forgiven, to be right with you. And we ask you to, your grace will be extended, Lord, to us. And we pray that we will not only understand these things, but apply them in our lives as we seek to walk with you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so according to Jesus, let's look at some of the things he says about his Days of his coming. The days of his coming. Let's turn to Matthew 24. One day we'll go to Matthew 25. There's always, uh, we always go to Matthew 25. There's never enough time. Well, we're going to go to Matthew 25 maybe the next time. And look at the parables of Jesus. We've done the parables of Jesus here, so it shouldn't be a big surprise when we talk about the parables uh, that he spoke in that Olivet Discourse. So what is the Olivet Discourse? It's basically the longest teaching that Jesus has ever did on his, uh, on his coming. It is in Matthew 24 and 25. It's the longest version of it because Luke 21 has a version and it's not as long. And Mark 13 has a version. It's not as long. And John doesn't have a version, but um, we know already, you guys already know, John has it throughout his whole book. So all these little hints about light and darkness and about the one who's coming in his own name and they will worship him, they will follow him and Jesus will come in his father's name and they won't follow him, they won't seek him, they won't obey him. Those are all little hints throughout John that uh, these are things about the final end, about the end times. So what do we know about the Olivet Discourse? Well, let's read it real quick and the first few verses will tell us a little bit more about what Jesus said of his coming. I always like to, whenever we start talking about the end times, it's always important to read what Jesus said about the end times because he is the authority on the end times. Everything else comes out from him. What Paul said, what John said, what the apostles said, what Revelation says, of course written by John, are all built on Matthew 24, 25 and the other passages. So if we want to understand the, uh, the, the end times or the coming of Jesus, Read what he said about it. Very simple. Read what he said about it and uh, know that he's speaking to his disciples. He's not speaking to unbelievers. He's not speaking to uh, necessarily unbelieving Israel. He's speaking to uh, believing, believing Jews that will ultimately preach the gospel, as he would say here, uh, at the end. So Jesus came out of the temple and he was going away when his disciples came up to the point to point out the temple buildings. Talked about uh, a lot about this is that the the temple buildings were amazing. This was Herod's temple, as they would call it. This is the second temple. And uh, although it was built by Ezra, Nehemiah, and uh, and, and the Jews that came back from the exile, it was certainly expanded by Herod. I mean, we're talking 14 acres that he developed, and all by hand, I mean, without machinery. The, The amount of work it took to get the temple buildings the way they are, I wish I had more pictures of them, the, the ancient pictures of the, of the, of, of the buildings. The, the largest stone of that second temple is way bigger than any stone on the Pyramid of Giza. I mean, it's unbelievably huge and immense, and, and it weighs so much more than anything we have in this world. So it was a massive, massive building. And uh, during the time of Jesus, it would have, they would have been building. They would have been expanding it because they didn't finish until about 65 A.D., Well after Herod had died, well after Jesus had died, the building continued on. The building continued on until about 65 AD. So um, imagine Jesus walking around. There would have been the scaffolds and people still chiseling away. It would have been quite a scene. And the temple was there and the massive stones and the massive buildings would have been impressive. Impressive enough for the the believers, I mean the uh, disciples to say, Look at all these buildings. Look how great it is. Look how awesome it is. Look how God, what God has given us. 
And Jesus said to them, do you see all these things? Truly I say to you, not one stone will be left upon another which will not be torn down. That would have been a big air out of the balloon for those who were listening to Jesus, especially the disciples would have been unfathomable. How can, how can you say that? This is God's building. Well, it's amazing to think that it happened before. In the time of Jeremiah, Jeremiah said the same thing to the Jews, that God was going to come and he was going to bring the Babylonians and they were going to judge the city and the temple was going to be destroyed. It was going to be gone. And this house will be left desolate. Uh, they couldn't believe it. And it happened. It happened just as Jeremiah said. It happened at the time of the disciples. Jesus predicted what happened in 70 AD. It happened. The Romans came. Uh, unbelievably enough, they came on the same day, the same day that the Babylonians destroyed the temple in 565 is the same day that the Romans came and destroyed the temple in 70 AD. Uh, it, it's, it's, um, it's one of the anomalies of history, right? It's basically the, uh, the, the day of desolation. Even the Jews think about it, and the, it just happened not long ago, where they think about the destruction of the temple, right? It is, the, it is a very dark day for them. It's the destruction of the temple happened on the same day. Now, that's an impossibility. It's an improbability. It's, it's statistically impossible for that to happen by two different empires separated by five, six hundred years, and yet God is trying to get their attention, right? So God's trying to get their attention. And Jesus said it would happen, 70 AD. Uh, it happened just as Jesus foretold. Not one stone will be left upon another. Josephus tells us that when the Romans began to lay siege on Jerusalem and, and got the temple, got to the temple, they, they misfired into the temple. The gold started melting because of the fire, and the stones had to be taken apart one by one. In fact, if you go to Israel today, you go to Jerusalem, you will see a street that's right below by the, uh, by the Wailing Wall, just below that, because it's up on a, the Wailing Wall, or the Catel is up, and there's a street called, or I call it, the Wall Street Crash. All these stones from the original temple are on the streets, just completely uh, bearing witness to what Jesus said. Not one stone will be left upon another. They're still there. You can still walk along those, wall, those stones. All of those stones will cry out. They would say Jesus was right, and he was right. It happened in 70 AD. So he is speaking of something prophetic, and it did happen in history. And he was sitting on the Mount of Olives. So we switch scenes, right? All of a sudden, we're by the temple, and then we switch scenes. We're in the Mount of Olives all of a sudden. So what happened? They had to walk down about a 30-minute, maybe 15-minute brisk walk from the Temple Mount down the Kidron Valley up to the Mount of Olives. Just kind of appreciate the geography. It might be a little boring, but you got to think. What would you be thinking after Jesus told you this old thing was going to be gone? What would you be thinking? I, I could imagine the disciples talking to each other, elbowing each other. You know, hey, do you think it's this true? I can't believe you said that. You ask him. No, you ask him. No, you go and ask him. And, of course, they were sitting by the Mount of Olives, kind of a awkward. You ever, you ever walk with somebody after they said something so profound and so unbelievable that you just couldn't say anything? And, and it was sort of an awkward walk. And well, that's what they felt for about 30 minutes going up the Mount of Olives. They finally privately came to him. Now, another, another gospel that tells us it was, uh, it was all of them. It was some of them. But it was, his math, uh, uh, it was Peter, James, and John came to him. Tell us when will these things be, or when will things will happen? What will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? So they attributed it all like, like good Jews would have thought. This all would happen at the same time. Because right? that was the, the eschatology of the Old Testament. The eschatology of the Old Testament is when the Messiah would come. right? Then the kingdom would come. But it didn't happen that way. Uh, not the way they thought, right? Even John the Baptist, are you the one? Are you the one that was supposed to come, or should we look for another? They thought when the Messiah would come, it would happen right there and then. It didn't happen right there and then. Uh, Jesus brought something more important. He brought the kingdom within us. He needed to have his own people redeemed and forgiven of sin and redeemed through the new birth before he establishes the kingdom, like King David. So that had to happen first. That part of the, his suffering and his, um, his ministry 
wasn't quite clear to the Jews even at this time. Remember, we're still in, a, in an Old Testament scenario, Mosaic law is still in place. And so they thought that Jesus was here, it would be, that Christ was here, it should start. Same thing here. When Jesus would come, then everything will come to place, right? That would, that would be the end of it, right? Um, the, the sign of your coming, the, it will be the temple, it would be signs, and it will be the end of the age. Now, just like every prophecy in the Bible, it happens in stages. Not everything happens at once, right? When Jesus came, not everything happened at once. It had to come through stages. His life, his ministry, his uh, death, his resurrection, his ascension, all happened in his coming, but it happened in stages. So it will be his second coming. It will be the same way. It will happen, but it will be in stages. It will be in sections. It will be uh, some things will happen very rapidly, like in the book of Revelation. Some things will take time to get there. It's like a flashpoint. Once you get to the flashpoint, it happens quickly, but it takes a long time just to get there. Right? So what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Notice all these things in their mind will happen together. The preterist would say all this happened in 70 AD. Right? Part of it did happen in 70 AD. Right? Part of it did. This is remember our understanding prophecy. Not everything happened at once. Preterists believe this all happened in 70 AD. I would say... No, it did not happen in 70 AD, not all of it. The destruction of the temple did. Not one stone be left upon another did. The persecution of believers and Jews at that time did happen. But the sign of his coming, it didn't happen. Right? The, the preterists would say that was the sign of his coming. Well, did Jesus come in 70 AD? Well, some preterists believe he did. Some preterists believe it happened spiritually. Jesus said he's coming once, he's coming back once. And it happened. It will happen the same way he left. It will be a physical return. And in the end of the age didn't happen. Why? Because Jesus did not give his, the eternal rewards to believers. He didn't separate the sheep from the goats. There's many things he didn't do that are described in this chapter. And remember, it's two chapters, 24 and 25. So we have to take in, in a whole context. So that, that's just a side note. Just some people tell you it's happened in 7 AD. No, it didn't. Part of it did. Partial fulfillment. But it will come to pass. The whole thing will come to pass. And Jesus answered, make sure no one misleads you. Well, I just told you. Make sure nobody misleads you. That's what Jesus said to do. So we're being faithful to the Lord. And you know, and people come up with uh, outlandish ideas. Just got to keep reading the Bible. It's just Jesus said it won't happen that way. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Messiah and will mislead just a few people. No, it doesn't say that. I am the Messiah, they will say, and will mislead many. The word many in, in Greek has the, the idea of majority. Majority of the people will be confused and deceived by what people are saying about his coming. That's not, I mean, I'm not trying to be outlandish. That is the, the reality of where we are even today. And I don't think some of the, the heavy things have happened yet. Some of the things have not come to pass. I mean, we're still in, in, in a bit of a labor point and sometimes a delayed labor pain, but not the full thing yet. Verse 6, you will hear wars and rumors of wars. Make sure you're not frightened, for those things must take place. But the end is not yet. I always make that emphasis. Look at when the Bible says must. They must take place. There's an important thing that we have to remember that Jesus says some things must happen. The Bible says things must take place. Uh, like the coming of our Lord, like the resurrection, like his death, like this, his resurrection. Those things, must, the, the preaching of the gospel must take place. But the end is not yet, meaning don't be frightened by these things. Don't lose your mind when it comes to events going on in the world, like wars and rumors of wars. Don't let those things frighten you. They have to take place, but that's not the end, right? Because nation will rise against nation and kingdom will rise against kingdom. In various places, there will be famines and there will be earthquakes, but these things are merely the beginnings of sorrow or the beginnings of birth pangs, like labor pains upon a woman. And they'll deliver you up to tribulation, and they will kill you and put you, in, and you'll be hated by all nations because of my name's sake. Now, that has happened to Christians throughout history. It has never happened to Christians and all over the world at the same time. And that's what Jesus is saying, that they will happen to all Christians at the same time in all the nations. So it'll be, it's something that still hasn't happened yet. They'll deliver you up to tribulation. Well, tribulation is one of those signposts that Jesus talks about here. I, I think of it as signposts, like markers along the way. 
birth pangs, tribulation, right? These are things that Jesus said will happen. They must take place. You'll be hated. Uh, at that time, many will fall away and will betray one another. So he moves into the area of the church, right? He's been talking about the world and things that are going to happen in the world, famines, earthquake, wars, and people are going to be losing their mind about what things are going to happen and when they will happen and speculations and false teachings and false Christ and false messiahs and lies and hypocrisies. But then it says, in, regarding to the church, there will be persecution, then many will fall away. And the betrayal of one another and many false prophets will arise and mislead many. many. Now, this is specific to the church, false prophets. Not just false messiahs, false prophets into the church. Uh, false messiahs will go to the world. They will deceive people to thinking that they're the ones with the answer. They're the ones that will come uh, through them. Salvation will come. But through the church, there will be false prophets, meaning that they will proclaim something that is false. They will, And what is the... What is one sign of false prophets? What's one, one thing they say all the time that is normally associated with false prophets? Anybody have a... Jesus didn't come in the flesh. Okay. That is true. The Gnostics said that. But one thing was we associate with false prophets very easily to, to tell them. Was that? Yeah. They say nice things are going to happen, right? They say, don't worry about it. You'll escape all of this. Nothing will bad happen to you. There's no calamity, right? Uh, this is your best life now. This is your best thing, you know, your better things, you know. There's better things to do than worry about all this, right? Uh, you know, don't, don't, don't worry about these things. God's just going to bless you. And, and they'll tell that to people that need to repent. They'll tell that to people that need to get right with God. False prophets will always tell you what you want to hear. That's by far a clear you get somebody that tells you what you want to hear, you may have, that's not the only test, but that's a big test, right? A true prophet will always tell you what you need to hear. In fact, they will oftentimes, uh, at their own detriment and at their own peril, will tell you the truth, uh, even if you hate them, even if you don't like them, even if you, uh, they'll run the risk, right? Because they love you. They want to tell you the truth and they love the Lord too. Uh, and if God told them to say something, it's usually to a people that are stubborn and obstinate, it'll be a sign of a warning, right? To a people that are persecuted, it'll always be an encouragement. To a people that are lazy, it'll be exhortation, right? As well as a warning, but there'll be encouragement as well, right? But there'll always be false prophets in the church that will lead, and it says again, will mislead many. The word many, majority. But look at this here. It says, Verse 12, lawlessness will increase and most people's love will grow cold. Now, it translated that way. Most people's love will grow cold. Um, the idea here has to do the love of many, we would say, the love of many. And the word is agape. Okay, remember, we're dealing with things of the church. It's not dealing with the world, right? I oftentimes hear this verse associated with the world. Now, it is true, in fact, it is a loveless world. But the world's always been loveless. They didn't love Jesus. Jesus said they hated me. They'll hate you first. They didn't love me. They didn't love God. They didn't love the truth. They didn't love the Father. So it had always been a loveless world. It's always been Christians and, and Christ who's brought love in any, in any sort of way to any society, whether it was about marriage, whether it was about children. It was always the love of Christ who uh, changed the way people treated one another. But then it says the word, uh, most people's love. The word is agape. All right, and I will tell you one thing. There's only one people on the face of the earth that have agape within them. Well, who's that? Believing Christians. They have agape. They have agape for God. They ought to have agape for one another. Now, oftentimes, sometimes that's not uh, exercise, but we have it. It's just not exercise. Um, people that are married, right? You get to have agape for the same person over and over and over and over again. You get to practice it, right? That's one one advantage of marriage is you get to practice agape with someone, and they, they may drive you up the wall, but you have to practice agape. Right, Frank? Practice agape, right? Uh, now, if you're single, you still have to practice agape. You're not off the hook yet. It just means that you have to do it, you know, perhaps more widely spread, right? Uh, that doesn't mean married people don't love other people, just that it's very concentrated in a relationship, and you get to practice. So learn about your relationship with your wife and husband, and then practice with other believers as well. But it's a very, very important test of our agape. 
It's when we're married and we get to practice that love for one another. But then it says here that that's going to grow cold. That's going to grow cold. That's a prophecy, by the way, of Jesus that believers' hearts and their love will be, will be colder and colder at the end. And uh, that means that because of persecution of, or sin, and, you know, obviously the context is um, the false prophets have come along, right? And so they tend to, tend, tend to uh, turn God's people's love cold because uh, we're focused on other things. It tends us to focus away from the Lord and his word and his truth. So we don't practice agape love with one another, but it is a command of the Lord. Didn't he say love one another, right? So uh, the church is going to forget this command, it seems like. Now, just because Jesus said it would happen, it doesn't, need, doesn't mean it needs to happen to you, right? That just, that's, that's one thing for sure. It doesn't mean it needs to happen to you. And notice that it says it's not going to be everybody. It's just most people, right? most people, right? It doesn't mean you. Why did, why did Jesus give us this warning? So it doesn't happen to you, right? Exactly. Yeah, so you, you know, hey, hey, you notice your heart not? And what is the test that First John gives us, right? First John, it's a test. If you're a Christian, you love, yeah. That's a real test. It's a big test, right? And um, because if you love others, you show that you love God. How can you say you love God and hate your brother, right? It's all filled with that. And so, see, prophecy, when we study end time stuff, it's not this curious thing that people get into. I'm going to find out what's really, you know, what's going to happen in the future. I'm going to, I'm going to find out some details that's going to help my life or curious things, right? Curious people want to know curious things. It really is the fundamental things that you've always learned, right? Love one another, trusting God, not being misled, right? Keeping you know, don't be afraid. You know, basic things that we would teach kids in the back, right? Don't be afraid. Love each other. Trust Jesus, right? And uh, don't let anybody deceive you. Very, very basic things. All you're doing it is practicing it on a very large scale, I guess you would say, and with more pressure because it comes with more pressure, right? So learn now. Apply them now. By the time this happens, you'll be an expert. You'll be an expert, right? Verse 13. But the one who endures till the end, he will be saved, right? As we talked about salvation being a three-step process in a sense of what the Bible speaks about. There's justification. You were saved. There's sanctification. You are being saved. You're being saved now through the Holy Spirit and through the life of Jesus uh, as you wait for his return or our departure or to uh, basically if we were to pass away. Uh, then we will be saved, right? So the Bible speaks of salvation in those three terms. A past event, you got saved, you were saved, praise the Lord. You're being saved, and you can rejoice in that. You are being saved. Paul talked about that, right? You are being saved. You're being sanctified. You're being made, set apart and being made more like Jesus. And then you will be saved. It's the process complete. You are like Jesus now. That's the ultimate salvation, right? And we have to keep that in mind. Salvation is not just going to heaven. That's a, that's a great bonus and a great added uh, uh, on top of what we get. But salvation is really being like our Lord, right? God had a son, has a son, and he wants all his children to be like his son. And so he's in the process of making us more like Jesus every day, sanctification. And one day we will be like him, First John 4 says that. We'll, we will be like him. And that's, at that point, it's the process of salvation has been completed. You are like Christ. So think of salvation as an aim, as a goal that you're going toward. Yes, you are saved. Yes, you are being saved. And if you are doing those things, you will be saved. Very simple how the Bible, we complicate things, right? As men, I mean, we complicate things. But the Bible is very simple because salvation is being like Jesus. How are, you, how are you more like Jesus today? Are you more like Jesus today than when you, were, when you first got saved? I hope so, right? I hope so, right? And you, and you can look back and say, okay, am I growing? And the book of Hebrews gives us that wonderful test. Right? Are you growing? Are you, a, are, you, are you in God's word? Are you praying? Are you going to the high priest? Those things are assure, uh, if you do them, they assure you of your growth. Then you are being saved, right? Do you approach God's word? Are you in God's word? Do you, do you love others more than you did before, right? Or are you still having trouble with relationships with Christians? By the way, we're always going to have trouble in relationship with Christians, right? 
there's always going to be some effect or some, uh, some turbulence, some tension. But how do you solve them? How did you used to solve them? And how did you solve them now? Right? Well, I used to solve them by never speaking to them again. Yeah, that was it. Okay? Peace of mind. I used to solve them by ignoring them. I used to solve them by being harsh toward them. I used to solve them whatever way. Now, but what does the Lord tell us how to solve them? He says, go to them. Speak to them. Forgive them. Make sure, reconcile. Get things right. As much as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Is it possible at all, all the time? No. There are times where Christians harden their hearts against other Christians. There are times where Christians don't go to other Christians. They'll go to everybody else, but they won't go to that person that had offended them or has an issue with them. So, uh, But see, you grow and you realize this is the way the Lord wants us to deal with it. And so you're becoming more like Jesus, right? You notice how far we were from Jesus now than when you first got saved? When you first got saved, you thought, wow, thank you, Lord, for saving me. Yeah, you got a good deal, Lord. You know, I'm here, right? <laughs> you got a good deal, me and you, all the way, right? Then you start walking with the Lord, and you realize you really are a scumbag, and you really are not who you thought you were, right? Because God is showing you. How, how, you know, the, the hardness of heart or the, or the difficulties you have in forgiving people or your temper or your lust or your selfishness comes out, right? Uh, marriage will show you a lot about your selfishness, doesn't it? Married couples, right? Show you a lot about your selfishness. It, it'll show you if you are or you're not or if you're growing in that. Right? We all have some measure of selfishness, right? But it's, it'll show you right away. Why? Because you have to live with someone and have to... Deal with them, and you have to love them despite the fact that you don't agree and have to not necessarily comply and compromise, but it is a little bit of complying and compromise in a good way because you're not trying to get your way. Like, who wants to get their way all the time? Frank, you do? Okay. Who wants to get their way all the time? You don't have to raise your hand, right? Yeah, that was, okay. You don't have to get your way all the time. Who wants to get their way all the time, right? You don't have to. What's the, what's the point of getting it? Anyway, I belabor the point. Read James chapter 2. Where all the wars come from, isn't it from selfishness that you really want, you know? And the ultimate wars are not the ones, I mean, they're bad in the world, but the biggest wars I've seen are the ones in the home. It's the most painful ones, horrible ones. And a lot of time comes from one or both couples are trying to get their way. And, and, and James talks about it. It comes out of selfishness and selfish ambition. It doesn't, it's not, it doesn't come from above. It doesn't come from the Spirit. It doesn't come from godly wisdom. It comes from selfishness and even... Now, this is James. He says, it's demonic. Ooh, well, nobody wants to hear that. So let's not talk about that, right? No? Okay. Well, we could mention that, right? Well, the men's, men Bible study studying us, so come, men. We're, we're studying James. Uh, it's demonic. It's, it's really not from God. It's not peaceable. It's not rational. It's not reasonable, James says. So whenever you find things that are not reasonable... Things that are not peaceful, things that are not gracious, things that are not uh, in com complying with other, uh, with, especially in a marriage relationship or believers, then you know it's not godly wisdom. It's being, it's coming from another, another source, and we all can fall prey to that and be influenced by that. Right? We still have the flesh that wants to still govern over us, so that's part of that. Right? But you guys already know this, right? And so we're still dealing with basic Christian doctrines, right? Basic Christian things that, you know, if you've been saved for a period of time, you know them. And, you know, but now you have to live them. And so the end times has a way of really focusing in on the things that you already know, but now you have to live them, you know. And it kind of creates a spotlight because now you have to stand out from the world that is going this way and Christ wants us to go this way, right? And so now you're being challenged in your own life to live a godly life, to live a crucified life. And so better to do it now than to do it later. Best time to do it is now, right? If not now, when? Do you know that's a saying? Nike took that saying, right? If, if just do it, that kind of thing, right? But it was not Nike who came up with that thing. Or if not, it's not even me who said, if not now, when, right? It was actually, interesting enough, it was a Jewish rabbi, in the middle of between the first between the Old Testament and New Testament, right? Who uh, was tired of Jews going by the wayside? Who who saw people of God not in Scripture, not in the Word, not holy to God, 
And you had the influence of the Greek culture. The Seleucid Empire had come into uh, Israel. And they were drawing away Jews from the, from the word of God. And so this rabbi wasn't particularly upset that Jews were not following the Lord. Jews that were God's people and chosen of God would not commit to God. And they were actually behaving more like the Greeks, the unbelieving Greeks who were into sensuality and all kinds of things. We're going to give you a whole list of things. And in um, and, and Olympics, you know, the Olympics were done in the nude and all kinds of stuff. That was really interesting back then. And, uh, and Jews were participating in that. And there was a persecution of God's people, but there were many people who were compromising with the Greeks. And he said, that's enough. Enough is enough. If you're going to follow the Lord, follow him now. Just do it. Yeah. But if not now, when? When are you going to do it? And so I guess I would echo this, uh, this Jewish rabbi and said, if you're going to follow the Lord, do it now. But if not now, when are you going to do it? When are you going to make up your mind and say, you know what, this world's not my, my home. This world's not my own. I'm, going to, I'm a pilgrim, a sojourner. I'm just going to walk with the Lord. I'm just going to make up my mind. It's Jesus or nothing, you know, and, and just do it. And just do it. So there goes Nike. Just do it, right? So anyway, let's get uh, updates real quick. Um, we will discuss food shortages, by the way, because they're coming, if not already here. And this is not, remember, following Jesus' example. These things must take place, but the end is not yet. Don't be frightened, right? Uh, U.S. oil reserves, as low as they've ever been since like 1985 or something like that. So uh, and what does it all mean, right? So I was, uh, lots of questions. People have a lot of questions. And so this is why when we talk about updates and prophecy and end time stuff, people are curious because they want to know, right? But I read this article. It was really interesting. I, 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 I really recommend you watch, uh, you watch it. You read it, right? Um, this is from the J Post, Jerusalem Post. I think it was a couple of weeks ago. When was it? They have a date that, yeah, August 24th. So I just read it yesterday. Yeah, just read it yesterday, but it's been a while, right? So it's been seven days. Uh, and I thought the title was really interesting because I've been thinking a lot of this stuff, right? And so they had the, uh, the, 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 they published it out. This author, Is God Punishing the United States of America? This is from Jerusalem Post, right? So not necessarily a Christian um, uh, newspaper. Or journal, um, but it is Jewish, so they have a, a God, God uh, flavor to it. Uh, but it was quite interesting. You should read it. Put it that way. Is God punishing the United States of America? And uh, is by Sherwin Pomerantz. And what's interesting about it is that he he talks about all these things that have happened in America that we may or may not know. And uh, he did talk about the United States, but I think he's referring to North America to a large degree. Uh, but he was focusing on the United States because it's the most, obviously the most influential country in North America. Politically, he says, we have to admit the country is in a mess. He says, it's in shambles. I would add, it's in the middle of a civil war. It just hasn't been fought yet the way we think of civil wars as it was in the 1800s, right? Um, no one's taking up arms yet but against another, but I could say that it has already happened in some capacity. And we can talk about that. Uh, then he began to talk about the weather patterns. It's kind of interesting. Being a Jew himself, he would know the Torah and the Old Testament, where God said to believing Israel or unbelieving Israel, depending on which side you, the coin you would, uh, they would be in. But he told them that if they went to follow other gods and they stopped worshiping the true God, God will turn their skies and they will look like bronze and it would not rain. And they would have no food or, 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 uh, or crops at all until they repent and turn back to the Lord. Then God will make it rain. Now, this is the story behind Elijah. Elijah knew this. And when he prayed and asked the Lord, uh, after some time, God put it in his, in, in his prayer and within his spirit that he would pray that it would not rain until he said it. At his word, it will stop raining. And at his word, will make it rain again. That's quite a prayer, isn't it? Uh, but God put it in him because he knew he was a man of prayer. He's a man of the word. He knew that God said if they were to follow idols, God will stop the rain. And what were they doing at the time of Elijah? Right? You know that song, These Are the Days of Elijah and all that stuff, right? Great song, I guess, but they weren't so good. The days of Elijah were not so good. They were, they were really difficult days for Israel. The days of Elijah was filled with Jezebels. right? They were filled with false prophets and teachers and the, anything wickedness. 
and gross and among God's people you could imagine. But except one man, he was like a lump of salt in a, in a ball of manure, right? He was just like this, this light in a sea of darkness. And he prayed and he asked the Lord, he said, Lord, what do you want to do with this nation? They're gone and God put it in and pray. And he prayed and it would not rain. Now he prayed it would not rain. Now why did he pray for something so destructive? I mean, you're talking death, you're talking famines, you're talking major, major problems. Why would he pray something? I thought we we're supposed to pray only for good things, right? Bless me, Lord, right? Bless me, bless me, bless me. But here's a man of God who says, no, Lord, don't bless him. Actually, dry up the resources. So for what purpose? Yes, because these people are so hardened, Lord, that the only way that you would ever get their attention, you hit their pocketbook, you hit their source of income, you hit their God, you would say, right? You hit what they worship the most, themselves and their resources, and maybe they'll turn to you. Now, we can read ahead in Elijah's day, and, and it, it did rain again at his command, but after they repented and they said, the Lord is God, right? And it took a momentous occasion, Mount Carmel, for them to repent and to return to God, right? Long story short, didn't mean to preach about that. It means to say that... Um, this author, knowing that, he says, well, maybe God is causing this. It's just a question, right? Just a question. I'm not saying we're Israel or God has, you know, owes it to us just like he did to his people. I'm just saying God is a way of waking people up, of understanding where you are in history. Well, he says, there's been 1,500 tornadoes this year already, right? And um, they, oh, sorry, a year is about 1,500 tornadoes Per year. Uh, by June, they had already experienced a thousand. We have already experienced a thousand tornadoes. And we're on track for 2,000 this year, just to use this year alone, right? Uh, drought, right? So we have a mega drought. Let me just a picture here. Now, he didn't go too much into detail on this, so I'm just ad living it a little bit because uh, I've been tracking this stuff, right? So the U.S. monthly dr uh, drought outlook, right? So brown's really bad. This is as of July, so. Give or take has gotten worse, right? Uh, brown's really bad. Gray is, hmm, right? Yellow, um, developing, right? Uh, but brown is drought persisting, right? Uh, there's room for improvement in some other areas, but for the most part, brown is really bad. And here you have it. Here's the West Coast. And for the most part, is really, really dry. Here's Texas, really dry. So, um, by the way, it's not just a, this is ad-libbing, right? It's not in the article, but uh, this is Europe. Orange, really, really bad. Red, really, really bad, right? Most of Western Europe. The outlook for the next 10, well, over the next 20 years, from 30 to 39, uh, 10 years, 20 years, yeah. Um, looks, conditions throughout the world getting worse. This is looking ahead. Now, a lot of things can change. Weather patterns can change. But the ultimate part of the article is what's going on in, in America? That's what the, the, the whole thing was about. What's going on in America? And he goes on to explain that, you know, bad leaders, wicked leaders have stepped into the scene. You got California's got mega drought problems and an endless supply uh, problems with the supply chain, food shortages, at risk crop. Now, uh, go back a little bit here. In the United States, at-risk crops, wheat, cotton, rice, alfalfa, uh, because of the water levels, are completely low. In fact, uh, I, was, I couldn't get it in, but Mississippi had some really bad problems today. Uh, they just discovered that some of their water supply has gone into Deadpool. I mean, that there's no water that is going to go. I think it's, is it Jackson, Mississippi? Is that a city? Is that kid yeah. thinking about, okay, Jackson, Mississippi. Not Jackson Hole, like in Wyoming, but Jackson, Mississippi. Uh, running out of water. Now, this is a big city. Uh, and tomato shortages in California. So, like your tomatoes, maybe get some because they're probably going to get real expensive. Um, could it be possible that all this is happening at the same time for a reason? Right? For a reason. Not just in the U.S., but in the world. So, I hope that article gets people to think because it's a really good article and you have to think about this. Have we forgotten the Lord? 
For the most part, yes. Right? For the most part, it's just simply a remnant who still worships God, at least in this, in, 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 uh, in this country. And if we don't repent, it will go quickly. It will get further down. And so we have accepted every form of, mor- uh, of immorality yeah. in this country and perversion. So we've gone after children. We destroy their lives from the womb all the way to their teenage years. In fact, uh, we sexualize them and mutilate their bodies now as a right. So how long can the Lord really put up with that? Now, this is, uh, this is can, I, can I play this real quick, guys? Be good? Okay. Okay. Uh, Hope it doesn't scare you too much, but it's a little bit loud. So this is this is Sri Lanka, and this is uh, what's been going on there for the past month. president had a flea they got a new president and he's already trying to get loans into the into the country uh sri lanka has always been a poor country for the most part but the last 20 years they've had a boom in exports they've had uh, rice and wheat and all kinds of different things that they grow it's actually been a success until they started adopting world economic forum policies of don't grow your food don't use fertilizer and it descended into chaos, mad chaos. Now they're going to go to the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, and get all these loans, which will actually make the country completely uh, at the behest of the IMF, the World Economic Forum, and they won't be able to be prosperous ever again. They'll be basically slaves uh, to the world system. And uh, this is just one example. What happens is uh, they destroy the food supply, People began to riot. People began to... And a friend of mine told me, he says, give it three months, Europe is going to look like that uh, because of all the problems that they've been having. And uh, now they want to get a loan, and the IMF is really going to own it. Now, New Zealand is having none of that. This is New Zealand. Can I play this real quick? Uh, this is from the New Zealand. It's nowhere near Sri Lanka. But they don't want to get there. the news will show you this. Why? They don't want you to see this. They don't want you to have any information about that because uh, it actually makes people worried and you would have to do something about it, right? Now, let's talk about Europe very quickly because uh, it is an economic spiral, all right? Uh, This is household income crashing worldwide. That's, we're talking about Europe, but this is a global one, right? Household income is crashing, meaning that, uh, Your earning power is less and less because things have become more expensive and the worth of whatever fiat currency you have is a lot less. So this is uh, household incomes, very much crashing. This is inflation in different parts of the world, very high. This includes the United States because I think it's off the charts. Uh, Yeah, it's, it's really high. But you can see it's a world problem. It's not just a... It's not a Canada problem, it's not a U.S. problem, it's not a Mexico problem, although Mexico is pretty low, I don't think it's here, but uh, this is Poland, all right? This is Poland, uh, just a real quick video of what's going on in Poland. They, because of Europe and the issue with Russia and um, Ukraine, the energy crisis in, in Europe is massive. Energy crisis meaning that there's no, no energy, there's no... Uh, way to heat their homes. Well, who wants to heat their homes now? It's in the middle of summer, right? But winter's coming, and if you ever lived in Europe or anywhere cold, we know when it gets cold, it gets cold. You know, as Californians, we think 60 degrees is cold, right? Jason, nothing, right? Yeah. In Europe, it gets, this is minus. We're talking minus 10, minus 5, very cold. So they got to get ready now. 
Yeah, Germany too, yeah. Dozens of cars and trucks line up at the Lebelski Weigel Bogdanka coal mine in Poland on Friday as people fearful of winter shortages wait for days and nights to stock up on heating fuel. 57-year-old Arthur, who did not want to give his full name, drove 18 miles to get to the mine in eastern Poland, hoping to buy several tons of coal for himself and his family. Arthur's household is one of the 3.8 million in Poland that rely on coal for heating and now face shortages and price hikes after Poland and the European Union imposed an embargo on Russian coal following Moscow's invasion of Ukraine in February. Poland banned purchases with an immediate effect in April, while the bloc mandated fading them out by August. While Poland produces over So they are largely produced coal, but the wrong kind of coal, meaning that it's very dirty. They have to import Russian coal, which burns really well, but they have an embargo because of the war. So guess what? They have no coal, and so you have to stand in line for miles just to get coal for the winter. It's going to be a cold winter. They're getting ready. And uh, there's a lot of shortages. This is the energy crisis. In the UK, it's really bad. Uh, this is inflation. Um, energy crisis. They're calling it the winter of discontent, part two. If you remember the winter of discontent, if you're old enough to remember, uh, Margaret Thatcher and all that stuff in the late 70s, early 80s, is that was the issue was that the, it was so cold, and nobody, everybody was on strike, and nobody, there was no, nobody was picking up the garbage, there was no airport, there was, it was just absolutely horrific scene. Well, the winter of discontent is going to be, it's cold, and people can't heat their home because it's so expensive. They got a 50% percent uh, 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 rate hike, now they got an 80% rate hike, and then 2023, another one. So it's getting that expensive. So I'll give you one example. So this particular cafe in Leicester, Leicester uh, electricity bill normally about 12000 a year. Electricity bill normally for the year, $10,000, 10,000 pounds, $12,000 a year. With the rate hike, $64,000 a year with the rate hike. So what do you think she's going to do? She has to close. There's no way. You can't do it. So as, a, as an owner, and many businesses have gone into, we're shutting down, high energy cost. 130,000 of them have pledged they will not pay their electricity bill by October because it's going to go up 80% by October 1st. They're not going to pay it. So this is, again, the winter of discontent. People are not going to pay their bills. So are they going to shut them down? Is the government going to shut them down? Now, uh, Boris Johnson really cares about them, and he actually uh, produced a package of about 54 million pounds, and he sent them to Ukraine because, you know, he, he cares so much about the British people that he doesn't want them to suffer so much of this, so he, he's sending all this money to Ukraine. No, he really is. So I um, hope you got the, the sarcasm there, because he doesn't really care, right? And, uh, and he's out. Somebody else has to come in, but he's still causing them. Now, this is Italy. This is one of the uh, most, um, I guess you could say, one of the most uh, um, wealthiest cities in Italy. This is Milan. And this is people standing in line for food, just for food in Milan. We ran out of footage. It just kept going. It just kept going. Uh, what they did to the farmers was unbelievable. It's like what the Netherlands did. They don't let them farm. They want to take over the supply chain of food and the grow and the growing food. Uh, they can't. They can't really do it anymore. So they can't grow their own food, and um, they have no energy. This is Europe. This is not like some some third world countries. It's very very expensive to live there, and it's getting worse now. France has a a big issue, but France is launching climate change police. Right? Because it's already bad enough. Right? You've got to make it worse. France is launching climate police, meaning that if you don't like what they're doing for climate change, this is all the green agenda from the World Economic Forum, that you can't have fertilizer, 
You can't have energy. You can't have a carbon footprint. You can't have a car. You can't have a, can't have a house, can't have food. You got to have to have bugs, or right? eat, eat, eat bugs and things like that. Climate change police. And today, actually a couple of days ago, Gazprom, which is a Russian gas company, largest one in the world probably, if not the largest, uh, cutting gas supplies to France. So guess what's going to happen to France in the winter? It'll be very, very cold. But don't worry, climate change police will be there to make sure that you're following the green agenda. Now, you would think at some point you'd be like, okay, Pastor, this is crazy. Like, this is, has to be almost unbelievable. Like, who would actually go through this whole rigmarole? They are. Their policies. Who would vote for this? Who would actually want this? People have become so deluded into their thinking. Not saying you, not saying maybe I or, or people we know, but a majority of people have said, eh, who cares? Ten years ago, who cares? Who cares? Now, people are going, oh, my goodness. What happened? Belgium, uh, food is going through the roof. In fact, uh, electricity is going through the roof. More expensive than a year ago. Natural gas, 106%. Electricity, 57%. So much so, the farmers finally had to do something about it. These are Belgian farmers. CNN showed any of this, or Fox, I think any of these things. Why? People don't want to say anything. They don't want people to know. They, whether it's for fear or they want just the reality, they don't even care about the reality. Germany, Germany's got a big problem. Frank brought up the, the, the wood. Uh, a quart of wood is like hundreds of dollars. I mean, it's just crazy. It, Jason was telling me, how much is a quart of wood in uh, Canada? Uh, it's four foot wide by four foot high by eight Yeah. About two hundred dollars for a quart of wood. Yeah, uh, Germany's much more than that. I was, I was, I thought it was less, but it was actually much more. Cut like maybe three, four hundred dollars just for a quart of wood. I mean, we're talking. How do, no, oh yeah, this is the German. Oh, yeah, the elites. They'll be just fine. They could afford pretty much anything. Uh, Germany is heading toward a, a crisis. Now this is. The German power price looks like a hockey stick, right? It's just here, and it's just through the roof, right? This is energy in Germany. It's, it's the megawatt hour has gone insane. You can't afford it anymore. So, and of course, the poor are the one that suffers the most, right? Now, this is EU has a plan, okay? EU has a plan, and um, the plan is try to stop this. Now, this is in the Eurozone. The Eurozone looks like this. This is the CPI, Consumer Price Index. Everything is through the roof. Everything's more expensive. And you would say, well, what's, what's the big deal? I don't live in Europe. Don't think the U.S. is exempt from this. We'll talk about that in a moment. But this is the president of the EU, Ursula. And uh, she has some interesting things to say about the energy crisis. The skyrocketing electricity prices are now exposing, for different reasons, the limitations of our current electricity market design. It was developed for completely different, under completely different circumstances and completely different purposes. It is no more fit for purpose. And that's why we, the Commission, are now working on an emergency intervention and a structural reform of the electricity market. All right. Did you understand anything she said? I'm not talking about her accent. I'll translate it. We understand how little we understand about electricity prices. That's what we understand. We don't know what we understand. Now, five choices. I believe they have five choices. This is all the choices that the EU has. They can subsidize the price of energy, uh, increasing the deficit and treaty violations, meaning that they could... Uh, uh, they have to trade with other countries that they weren't thinking about. They could do nothing and let their business go under. They just let the people suffer. They can do the unthinkable. They can go to Russia and say, hat in hand, and say, we're sorry. Let us have gas. Let us have coal. And then it becomes Joe Biden's war. You see how it goes? Because NATO, 
more con major countries in Europe are in NATO. They would have to stop being NATO, or at least back off of it, and it becomes Joe Biden's war. It becomes your war. It becomes my war, which nobody wants that war except for them. They can set price controls, which will basically pro, uh, you know, no producer is going to want, and they're going to be out of business. So remember price controls? You guys are way young, way young. But, you know, Nixon did it. Remember Nixon did it? Frank, you remember Nixon did it? Scott? Scott, how could you remember that? You were a wee lad. You were a wee lad. Exactly. Price control is like suicide. It's basically saying to the gas station or the producer or whatever you're selling, you can't charge any more than this. You have to buy it really expensive, but you can't charge them any more than this. So you might as well say, I'm not going to sell it because I'll lose money. It's ridiculous. So we just won't be able to find it. All right? They can ration energy, which they are doing now. Don't shower every other day. Right? For some people, that might be okay. I don't know. But, you know, uh, I die, you know, that kind of stuff. But, you know, shower every two days, you know. Set your thermostat at 60 instead of, you know, 65 or 70, whatever it is, right? Um, or they cannot pay and let this thing just be destroyed. Now, what's interesting about this is that if the, the, the European problem is going to become the world's problem, because guess who's going to sell them energy? Who has to sell them energy? Huh? Hold on, I'll get back to China. I said something very interesting. We will. Now, well, wait a minute. We need the energy here, too. So what's going to happen to our energy if it goes there? Oh, you, yeah. It, it's just going to be unbelievably expensive. So the world is going to bear the cost. But Joel, he's a prophet. It's in the Bible. And then this brother, Joel, said something that it is happening now. Well, guess who's buying all the energy from Russia? China. Guess who wants to sell the energy that they're buying from Russia? China. At what price? Exorbitant prices. Who wins? And who else? Yeah. These guys are not as stupid as CNN told you, right? Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. I'll repeat it. Uh, Joel's in the industry, so he's energy. So if you, if you need energy, go to Joel. No, I'm just kidding. This. <laughs> That's the local energy supply here, yeah. Well, it's, it, was, it, was, it was created through, I guess you would say, crude oil, you know, same way like a jet would, you know, take off and, you know, get started. They would have burners and they would boil the boilers and they would boil, you know, water, make steam, be pressurized, would turn turbines to create electricity. Yeah. Um, well, it leaves a carbon footprint. So, more than like. <gasps> Ooh. And they this the plant got sold to China? We go down in one avenue, and the plant that my dad used to work at is now being parted out and sent over to China because there's no, there's I did no, not no know rules that. against selling it to China. Well, they can do whatever they want. There's hmm. no regulations on what they, how they create power. Yeah. Oh, yeah, they, they, they don't. Yeah. Yeah. So the plant that your dad used to work at is now being sold to China. So the energy producing plant. Yeah, the energy producing plant. And locally, yeah. Locally. And what I don't understand is... I don't understand. No worries. Yeah. Do it after. Yeah. So we'll have the uncensored version afterwards. Right? So, so um, Biden is threatening to cut off energy exports to Europe because he realizes he's got a big problem in his hands because the US was that well whatever little energy is left he doesn't want to send it out now here's the problem one problem the US uh payer the 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 the, the utility you know us we're paying for utility uh, it's behind, I think it's one in six is behind six months in utilities in, the, in America. One in six is behind. So they haven't paid, or at least haven't paid fully their balance since, what are we, September now? Since March? 
right? So they've been carrying a balance. They're just not paying it. Now, during the uh, 2020, 2021, uh, companies were not allowed to shut anybody off, even if they didn't pay. That was just the regulation. Um, what are they going to do now? There's no regulation on that. Now, they may say we're going to be, you know, for the little guys and stuff like that. But if people don't have the money to do it, are they going to shut them off? Now, this is in the U.S., and there's a big problem in the U.S. People are charging their credit cards to pay everything else, food, gas, utilities, right? They're charging it. How are you going to get this ever con under control? Now, there's layoffs everywhere. I think it's uh, half the U.S. companies are laying people off. Today, I heard from uh, uh, Snap. It's 20%, right? Uh, other people are laying people off very quietly, right? In, in California, it's interesting. They have already said that during the day, you can't charge your electric vehicle. You have to wait until night. This is... Yeah. So, sorry, Kamala. She cannot charge her car, her electric. You know how you're supposed to get rid of all gasoline cars by 2035. So right now, because of the energy crisis in California, because we're selling the plant to China, you can't charge your electric vehicle. They're telling you, you can't charge your electric vehicle during the day. You have to wait until nighttime at the uh, at hours that nobody's charging. Right. So they can't, we already know that if everybody, if one third of Californians got Electrical vehicles, the grid couldn't control it. They, they, they would just explode. The, the, the grid can't hold it. So they're pushing electric vehicles. They have no way out of this situation. It's like, it's like God has given them over to a judgment that they can't even think rationally. They can't get out of it. And they're driving people into oblivion, right? And this is, this is again, part of the World Economic Forum. What do they want to control? Food. Electricity, right? Why do they want to control those two things? Well, it's very simple. If you can control food, control everybody. Control energy, control everybody. Yes. And so what that means is basically if, if there's less of something, scarcity, then it drives the price up. People can't afford it, right? But now you're dependent on them. You're de totally dependent on the government for food and for energy, which is really the goal at the end. And I'll show you why. Uh, this is, again, a... Um, this is what happens to the Amish. This is what happened to the Amish. This is a, um, a farmer in Pennsylvania. Was it Pennsylvania? Yeah, I'm pretty sure it was Pennsylvania. Who basically were, the federal government went in there, the U.S. Marshals went in there, and they took over the farm. Uh, they produce meat, they produce all kinds of clean food, good food, and they have been selling it for, I mean, this is like their culture. This is like their generation after generation. They, they don't have electricity, so they don't even have any carbon footprint, right? They don't use electricity. They, they don't even have cars, tractors. They don't use diesel, nothing. They use horses, they use horses yeah. It's like going back to the 17th, 1700s, right? You just step into, into history. It's amazingly organic, and people love it, and they buy their stuff. I mean, he has a $300,000 fine for selling meat that it's not regulated by the government. Just a small farm, right? Um, and, and it's been around like 30 years. So this is, this is the U.S. government. This is parts of the government. Now, uh, this is Haiti. Uh, can I play this real quick, guys? Is that all right? Okay. This is Haiti. So just to let you know, it's not Europe. It's not just America. <laughs> Deuxième eh bien, journée mobilisation ça qui était commencé depuis eh bien, semaine qui se passe là. Haiti's a mess. They've been a mess. Earthquakes and famines and now no food, no energy. Uh, let's talk about Canada for a bit, all right? So <laughs> uh, Trudeau, he wants to go back to the COVID thing. Now, I guess we're a little bit free because YouTube lower their standards now. So I guess they're not, you know, uh, they don't really care if you say things, right? They want to go back to the app. They want to go back to the app and they want to, this is the same app and this is the same government who basically told everybody, yeah, we've been, in, we've been spying on Canadians for like three years. And uh, millions of them. We know where they've been. You know what they've been doing. You know what they've been talking. You know, they got the tax and everything. So uh, now they want Canadians to go back to the app. 
And they are hiring quarantine facility uh, supervisors. So if anybody want a job, here it is. All right, you can get a job at a quarantine facility. People that don't comply with the government, you, this is, I think it's in Ontario. Was it Ontario? My eyes are really bad here. Public, da, 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 da. I think it's in Ontario. Yeah, it is Ontario, right there. Region of delivery, Ontario, right? They want to hire security. If you want to be a security security guard for the Gestapo, right? Go ahead, do that. And uh, they're threatening farmers. Now, they are taking over the farms, just like Netherlands. They're taking over the farms. Can't use fertilizers, can't do this, can't do that. They have gone into farmers' land, which in, in some parts, like Saskatchewan, uh, they have certain policies and you can't do it. So they're fighting. The local government, the local province is fighting with, uh, with Ottawa because there are climate change ministers, police, climate, just like France, climate change police, going into farmlands, collecting water right, and samples and saying, oh, you, you're using too much fertilizer. You're using too much of this. You, we have to shut you down. You got to have the fine. You can't. You can't work your farm. And um, this is in Canada. It's a big problem because Trudeau already said that he wants to. What is he wants to lower farms? The use of fertilizers in farms by thirty percent. If you ever worked on a farm, you ever grown anything, you need fertilizer. And it's been widely criticized, but he's still doing it. There's no opposition party. It's like California. It's a one party system, right? And uh, because of the, the liberals and the Democrats are together, they, um, he basically has carte blanche, do whatever you want. Now, what's, what's the goal? So I'll tell you, give you a lot of details. What's the goal? The goal, I believe, is this. I believe that you're going to have, yeah, here it is. It's the government wants to control the energy to do what? To you to be dependent on it through carbon credits. Uh, the government's going to take control of the food supply. The government's going to take control of the energy supply. At least that's what they're trying to do. People are fighting back. Some people don't care. At least the farmers care. The truckers care. Um, carbon credits. You will be given a like a credit card. This is your limit per, per month. If you go over the limit, you have to wait until next month. To, you, know, you took too many showers. You did this. You did that. You traveled too far. So carbon credits will be a commodity. It'll be a commodity. People be, will begin to sell carbon credits. Now, you think, this is impossible. Companies already do it. You can buy carbon credits. Tesla buys them all the time, uh, carbon credits. And they sell them to other companies who, you know, maybe a little bit more of a polluter. They'll buy carbon credits from Tesla, and they will pollute more because Tesla doesn't need them as much. So Tesla's actually, you know, crook or not, they're pretty smart about it. They just bought all these carbon credits at a low price, when the prices go up, and then they'll go to a, a Ford or Chevy or whatever company. Hey, well, we get carbon credits, but double the price, so they'll make double the money. So this is what's this where it's going: control of food supply and energy through carbon credits, and it'll be a it'll be a global thing. It'll be like a World Economic Forum policy, and you know, governments are all for it. Trudeau's all for it. Netherlands all for it. Biden's all for it. I mean, look what he's done with the um, with the energy crisis here. So now. Where is this leading to? Well, you see all the protests. You see what people are, have been doing. Uh, I believe there'll be a rise in crime. Now, that's not the only one who's saying that, but New York is going through the roof. Now, uh, this is crime in New York City. Where's the one? Okay. So overall, it's up. Overall is up. But these are the ones, rape, robbery, and overall crimes, 35%. This isn't just New York City. This is Manhattan. People just walking. They take your watch. Gone. Uh, just like normal, people walking, take your stuff. Manhattan. Uh, this is in California. Uh, you seen these flash mobs going into 7-Elevens? Be careful. You know, you might be at a 7-Eleven where they do a flash mob. People go in there, and this doesn't have any audio, Tony. So it's just it's just footage. Kids, young kids, you know, maybe in their you know late teens, twenties, they go in there. What's for sale? Everything. Counter. People go in the back. And of course, they can't just take the food. They gotta trash the place. They didn't even bring bags, yes. Because there were 10 cents or 30 cents, whatever they charge here, right? Um, of course, it becomes lawlessness. What are they going? Cigarettes and it was in LA. That's right. 
By the way, this is this happened in a, at other 7-Elevens. This is just the one that they caught on camera. <laughs> that, uh, underage gambling, yes. Don't promote. Don't promote that. Well, yeah. Gascon, is it Gascon still there? Yeah. Well, that's under a thousand dollars. Can't do anything about it, right? Yeah, you give a Bible out. Oh, they'll they'll be at your door. They'll be figuring out what church you go to. All right. So the flash mob. So the world has a way of dealing with it. They'll they'll fix it. All right. And so this is how they're going to fix it. They're going to. Yes, absolutely. This is how they're going to do it. They're going to bring mind control in a real way. Uh, law enforcers would actually use this to potentially, potentially uh, monitor and manage potential reoffenders. What's that movie? Minority Report. Is it Minority Report? Is that the one where they predict crimes? Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, yeah, that, Pre-crimes, yeah, it was the pre-crime unit, right? Uh, it'll be exactly that. Well, you, you, you were thinking this. We got you. We got you on thought. Got you on thought camera or something like that, right? Um, you were thinking about it. You've been known to do it, so you're going to do it again, right? So remember, a lot of times there's lawlessness. It's allowed for a greater purpose in terms of this globalist economic forum ideas is to bring, yeah, don't let, it, don't let it go to waste. It's to bring greater control. Now, I'm not making this up. They want to do it. Now, Klaus Schwab has said he wants to do it. People that travel, now they want to put it on children from the womb, from the womb to kids, because he says, you know, that they will have greater opportunities, he says, because we already live in a cyborg world. This is his words. We, live, we already live in a cyborg world, so why are we keeping our children from experiencing all this, right? So we have an augmented reality world. So if your child has, let's say, a uh, um, learning disability, you can put a chip in them, and then when they go to school, their classroom will be enhanced in the metaverse, and they'll be able to learn better. See how it's, it's seen as a good thing, right? Now, which, which parent that has a, uh, a child with some disabilities wouldn't want their children to be helped, if you've got an autistic child, if you have some children that have reading disabilities or something like that, you, you, want, the, you want that help. Well, it's going to come in that form. By the way, it, it, back to the violence thing, because they, they want to they have this. I, I, I was reading this in Baltimore. It got so bad. You ever heard of a, a, an actress called Natalie Portman? Natalie Portman? Okay. She was doing a show. I think it's called The Lady of the Lake or something like that. It's going to be on Apple TV or something. I'm not, I'm not endorsing it. Someone's going to take this the wrong way and say, oh, you're endorsing this. I have no idea. I just know what happened. So in the movie set or in the series that we're filming it, the, the drug dealer showed up from Baltimore. They stopped the whole thing, and it was a racket. They asked, actually asked them for money, like $50,000 for them to actually film on their streets because it belonged to them. They tried to call the cops, and the cops said, no, they're serious people. You better do what they say. They, w <laughs> they would not get involved. So it was an extortion just to film in Baltimore. Drug dealers run the streets, just like in you know, parts of Mexico, just like it's coming here. It's exactly that. Uh, how to control crime? I think eventually they'll go through this. Um, fast forward this. Because the same group that wants to put chips in people's brain and kids, right, they're the ones who wants, also want to control AI. Uh, AI wants to control uh, censorship on the Internet. Now, this is a uh, – World Net Daily is a, a conservative, uh, somewhat Christian organization. I'm not sure all of them are Christians, that, but some are Christians. Uh, but it's a online journalism, right? Uh, this is what you'll find if you go there. All right, so I did it. I tried it. Went on there. Google search. Clicked on it. Well, if you're going there, it'll be harmful to your computer. It's being delisted as a safe engine, a safe site to go on on their search engine. So you can't go there unless you want to, right? Now, as a Christian, of course, I know that's a pretty safe site. You can go on there, whatever, right? But people are not going to be able to go on things. Why? It's AI world. This is the World Economic Forum plan. They want to control what's on the Internet, too. 
won't be able to watch anything or say anything. Uh, you know, it's another thing they want to do, and this is kind of an interesting thing. Uh, it's they want to control cash, and this is the ultimate control. This is where it becomes, you know, the carbon credit, the food supply, the energy supply, the end of cash. Now, one company's doing this already. October 1st, Starbucks, no more cash. Okay, October 1st, so uh, don't use it too much anyway. So to me, but, but, it's not to say it's a big issue. Uh, cash is society. Now, there a lot of people are getting angry at them. I don't know if they're going to backtrack on it, but uh, they are already going cashless as of October 1st. Now, it's already been, to them, it's very simple. People, Most people use the app. Most people just order mobile. Most people, so to them, it's like, we're already in a cashless society. And um, you're going to see more companies doing that. Now, they got away with it during the 2020, 2021, 2022, because, oh, cash is dirty, it's the viruses, all that stuff, right? But now that it's uh, quite clear that it's not that. Even CNN admitted it. Even the CDC admits it, that it was just, it's not as bad, whatever, whatever. Uh, now they're moving into what they have been doing all along. So people got used to it. People got used to it. It's just sort of, a, uh, it becomes habitual. Now, where's the future going? I believe the future going to central bank digital currency. The CBDC is control, is digital identity, is surveillance, right? And if you don't believe me, just look at Canada. Truckers went up to Ottawa. If you donated to the GoFundMe page, they shut down GoFundMe. They shut down your account for donating, right? People had nothing to do with the, with the protests. They just simply were on the side of the truckers, right? And they engaged by donating it. Their accounts were frozen. They were shut down, um, you have to have the right view, political view, in order to continue to use money in Canada during that time. So it's views for money. Pay for view, I guess you could say. Pay for view. You got the right view, you can pay for things. You don't have the right view, you're not going to pay for anything. You're not going to be able to use your money. This is where it's headed. Dependence. And of course, UBI, universal basic income, that you are going to be given a, a certain amount of money per month by the government because, uh, you know, we got AI, we got robots, we got people laying off, so you're not going to be needed. So what are you going to be doing? Collecting money. But there's a lot of people already that live on the dole, that live already on, on welfare. It's just going to be a transition from that system to the new system. Frank? Oh, definitely. There's always a black market within these... Uh... Oh, and at some point, they're going to try to control that, too, with stiff penalties and, and, and come after you in a big way. Now, I was going to mention China. Uh, we'll leave it up to another time. They're coming down again, even though the rest of the world's going, well, yeah, the, the, the virus wasn't that bad. And, it was, you know, there's no difference between a vaccinated person and an unvaccinated person. And, and, you know, sorry, you know, we destroyed your life and your kid's life and your business. And, you know, but, you know, you know, Fauci's just going to retire and everybody's going to be happy. Right. Uh, they're going, no, we're going to clamp down. Beijing's going hardcore now. now they got these little kiosks. You can get a test wherever you go. Uh, but they are locking down Ben. Uh, um, Parts of many, many, many uh, provinces, but Beijing, it's a big one that they're shutting down. Now, I did want to talk about this medication thing in America. I won't talk about it too long, but they're, they're trying everything to destroy kids. And this is a generation of guinea pigs. Our, our children are guinea pigs for the, for the New World Order, for the World Economic Forum. Uh, even experts that are not Christians are weighing in and says, are we medicating our children too much? Like everything that they have, there's a medicine for it, right? It, it's it's not like us, you know. You were you're down, you're something. You just you know, you talk to your mom, you talk to your dad, you dealt with it. You know, you went for a walk, you you just you know, you dealt with it. You went to church, you talked to your pastor. You, now it's medicine. Now it's just medication, over medication, psychiatric medications for children under 18. Not only that, but you also have. The, the trans movement that have destroyed kids, right? That they, they, they completely miss this, that the trans agenda has destroyed kids in such a way that uh, now kids have taken these hormone medications. Nobody knows. Nobody really knows anything about them long term, right? And uh, But we're really pushing this, right? And what about Trudeau and his euthanizing, right? He wants to euthanize. Uh, through his world, uh, through his government uh, healthcare system, right? It's very easy. What is it called? Uh, Made. Made. M A I D. Right. What does it stand for? 
Can't remember either. Medically assist them, something. Yeah, basically euthanasia. Yeah, you can get, it's very simple to get it. If you, I don't know if it's for kids yet or they have it for kids, but it's certainly, it's getting there. It's getting there. So this is, again, government-run health care. This is what it's going to look like. Now, all that to say, the answer or the, the end goal is not transsexuality or anything like that. The end game is transhumanism. The end game is transhumanism. I like saw so a video real quick. This is uh, Trump's uh, son-in-law. Uh, fascinating interview. You should watch the whole thing, but I'm just going to give you a clip where he talks about it. You know, now, I don't think he's a conservative in any means whatsoever, right? Uh, but he was one of the ones that was really behind railroad of Operation Warp Speed, you know, the, the vaccination thing, right? He was really in charge of that. Yes, yeah. What was the goal? I mean, really what they think. Okay, so I'm going to play the video real quick. This is how they think. And this is, it makes total sense about why they're so bent on medicine and experimental medicine. And, and then finally, I think that from, uh, you know, the last year, the one thing I've tried to put a priority on since I left the White House was, you know, getting some exercise in. I think that there's a, a good probability that my generation is hopefully with the advances in science, either you know, the, the, the first generation to live forever or the last generation that's going to die. And so uh, we need to keep ourselves in, in pretty good shape. And then the other thing I like. He's got a new book coming out and he's going to talk about immortality. He, he believes he's going to live forever. He says, hopefully, but, you know, he, he does believe that with all the advances in sciences and therapy and vaccines, he's going to be the generation that lives forever. Because uh, transhumanism is going to make it possible. Transhumanism is basically the idea that you can transcend beyond a human level and become more advanced, call it cyborg, call it... But what's the end goal? Yeah, as a god, divinity. The end goal is divinity. We're back to Genesis 3 again, right? You should be like God, right? And uh, so this is... What they believe, this is, this is transhumanism, ultimate goal. Why was homosexuality, transsexuality uh, brought on and accepted is to get people to accept certain things, to accept change, that you could be whatever you want to be, even that that means live forever, right? And the idea, I mean, talk about kids that are into sci-fi and all this stuff and Marvel heroes. and all. The idea might sound really interesting. What, me, live forever? Well, just take this. Just take this chip, just take this therapy, just take this thing, right? Now, the Bible tells us very clear that the only way to have immortality is through the gospel. Now, we do know, like Christians know the way of immortality is through the gospel, the death and resurrection of Jesus that has been brought to us light and immortality through the gospel, 2 Timothy 1. So quite interesting where the world's going and the push toward these medicines that nobody really knows what they're going to do. It's, it might kill millions of people before anything else. I was going to talk about the Baghdad and what's going on in Baghdad. I'm going to skip that real quick, maybe leave it for another time. But, yeah, the U.S. Embassy in Baghdad, big upheaval. The Iranians are behind it. Move over real quick. What? This is a big one. Pope Francis has ordered that, basically, uh, the wealth of the Catholic Church that has been spread throughout the world, been brought will be brought to the Vatican Bank. So through an ex we say like executive order, right? Uh, the Institute of Works of Religion, called the Vatican Bank, is going to by, I think it's October 1st. I don't have a date on this yet, but I think it's October 1st. They've got one month to get all this wealth that's all over the world in the Catholic Church to be consolidated into, maybe liquidate some things and get the money into the Vatican Bank. Now, why is he doing that? Now, there's no answer. I don't have an answer. Maybe you do. At, at this point, <laughs> I, I think I would agree with what Scott's saying here. I think he knows something that's coming. Well, what's coming? A big reset. And he wants to get the Catholic Church in a, the best position possible, to liquidate all his assets and get, into the, get all the money into the Vatican Bank. Now, this is unprecedented. No pope has ever done this. Maybe during the Middle Ages, some pope tried to do that, but they couldn't do it because it was so, you know, antiquated. There was no way of getting, you know, how many cows can you get into the Vatican Bank and that kind of stuff, right? But um, to accomplish this, he's instructed Vatican authorities to basically read his law, read, read what he said. It's like, a, like an executive order and bring all those accounts outside into the bank. It's really interesting at this point. 
your guess is as good as mine, what he's doing that. Now, I'll tell you one thing. Um, you know, the guy Elon Musk, I think there's something interesting. And I'm not saying he's, he's, uh, he's a good guy. Uh, remember the whole thing about Twitter? He was going to buy, he's going to buy, he's got all these backers. And then what did he do? He sold, like, millions of his techs, uh, Tesla stocks when it was really high. And then, no, the price went, oh, it crashed. And he has all this money now you know, in, in cash because he sold at the highest point. Now, now he doesn't want to buy Twitter. He says, oh, well, you know, I've got a problem with that guy and I've got a problem with that guy, so I'm not going to buy it. So I think a lot of these guys, including the Pope, uh, know that there's a great reset coming in a lot of different areas. You know, the, the, the debt uh, relief from, for the students, that's like a jubilee. Now, I believe a jubilee is going to come uh, now, with the word jubilee, I'll explain a little bit. Right? In the Bible, there is a jubilee. There's God's jubilee. Every what? 50 Every 50 years, right? Because of God wanted the land to remain within the families, right? You couldn't sell off your land. Now, you can lease it, right? You can, um, you can rent it. You can lease it. But you couldn't sell it. To any, you can sell it, but it had to go back to the family at the day of jubilee, right? So if you, let's say it's year 48 and every 50 years... It's a year jubilee. You would sell your land, but it would actually be cheap, at least somebody who's buying it, because you would only hold it for two years, right? Now, if it's year one, you can sell it for a lot more, right? The use of the land. And it will always stay within the tribes. It always stayed within the tribes. That was the whole point of jubilee. So nobody was indebted. Everybody had to be let go, be freed from their indenture servanthood and all that stuff. So I believe personally that a jubilee is coming to the world that's going to mimic what God has always done in Israel. And this jubilee is going to be to get people into a new system. We'll forgive your debts. How many people have a mortgage, right? How many people have this? How many people have credit cards? We'll forgive your debt. I mean, who wouldn't want that, right? House paid off, Joel, right? Did your house paid off? Would you want that? Huh? But you have to enroll in this system. You have to enroll in this system. It will pay your house off, but it'll actually be part of this conglomerate. You'll still live in there. You will never have to pay a cent. Uh, you just won't kind of technically own it. So, yeah. So that, that's the jubilee that I believe it's coming. It's, it's going to be this reset where, remember the whole 2030 plan? You'll own nothing, but you'll be happy. Would you be happy if your house was paid off? Yeah. But you won't own anything. Yeah. What's that? Well, we're just going to have to. Uh, yeah. And how many rooms do you have spared, Frank? You know, so you know we're going to have to make sure that we use some of those. You know, and uh, um, you know we'll give you some U U UBI in exchange for that. So, what is it leading to? If the Great Reset's coming, basically hunger. Yeah, <laughs> that would not be a bad thing in some cases, Frank. Right? Uh, the UN is warning many, many people are going to starve if nothing's done. And I don't think anything's being done. And I think it's actually things are getting worse, right? Oh, you did? Okay. Yeah, that's right. So I'll, I'll finish real quick. The Taiwan and Chinese incidents are getting more intense. I do believe that China will go after Taiwan within the next one or two years. Could be this year, could be next year. Um, Chinese uh, drones have gone into Taiwanese space, have been shot at. So Taiwan's very serious about this, by the way. And of course, Russia is going to host a joint operation with India, China, Syria, a bunch of other countries, um, Mongolia, Belarus, Nicaragua, Syria, Laos, Belarus. Uh, why? Because they want to flex their power. They got all these people behind them. It's kind of like the United States of Russia now. They got all these satellites coming in, and they want to flex their power. For what reason? To show the West that they have the resources, they have the backings, they have the weapons, and uh, so I do believe some wars coming, more wars are coming. So, uh, by the way, Biden is doing all he can to betray Israel and give them a deal. And uh, he's actually going to allow Iran to sell their oil everywhere in the world because, uh, you know, it's the right thing to do, he says, and to get a nuclear weapon. So uh, while our oil plant, our oil reserves, this is our oil reserves, oil reserves, oil reserves. So there's hardly anything anymore on oil reserves. Yeah, send it to China, send it to Europe. So um, I'll finish with this. Watch the patterns for the future. I'll give you about six patterns that we need to look for at the sort of the end of the year. I usually do this at the end of the year, but 
freebie today because I was thinking about it like, what is it going to look like? So patterns for the future, climate lockdowns, okay? Climate lockdowns. They already started. India did it. Australia did it. See, the lockdowns work so good. The, the, the virus one works so good, and people were so compliant, and people were just basically, uh, they, they did a behavior study, by the way. People were so, uh, if you want to read it, there, there's some good ones out there, how people were so compliant, and they love status quo. People love status quo, meaning that whatever the new current thing is, people like it, and they like to stay in there. And so people did it because they want to follow the government. So they, the government's found out that the people are willing to follow whatever the government says. Majority. Got a bunch of rebels here, but anyway. Um, UK government posted this. That, yeah, we did it, and we were causing fear to get people to do it. The Canadian government admitted it too, that they were using psychological manipulation on people. This is The governments are saying this. Um, rolling blackouts energy crisis, right? It's all going to come to climate lockdowns. They're going to lock you in because you can't go out there. It's too dangerous. Your carbon footprint's too much. We don't have energy. Imagine California saying, you can't drive your car today because we just don't have any oil. We just don't have any energy. So you can't turn on your car. You can't turn on your electricity. Uh, for works, so you have to work. So you have to stay home. We just have enough for you to stay home. That's what they're going to do. Second thing I predict or I think pattern, predict. You know, someone's going to call me a false prophet if it doesn't happen. But no, I, I believe these are things that are going to happen. Now, can, can it go wrong? Can it, go, can it happen in two years, three years? Yeah, probably. But Republican Party is going to implode. It's going to implode. What do I mean by that? People are so looking forward to this 2022, 2024, and all this stuff. Um, I don't think the Republican Party is going to look the same. And I'll, I'll explain what that means very quickly. Um, there are so many rhinos in the Republican Party, meaning that the Republicans in name only. They're not conservatives. Look at Cheney, who got involved in the January 6th. She's mad that she didn't get reelected. Uh, look at Romney, McCain, who passed away, Jeff Flake from Arizona. All these, McConnell, Lindsey Graham. I mean, these are people that, they, they are basically Democrats. They really don't care about conservatives in any way, or Christians in any way. So all they do, I mean, literally, look what they, they do. They vote for the January 6th. They vote for abortion. They vote for homosexuality. They vote for higher taxes. They vote for transgenderism, right? Even though they say, oh, you know, we're going to fight against this, just send us more money. They don't, right? And, uh, and they want more war, so they're going to get to a war. And they're just like the Dems. They're just like the Democrats. So what are the conservatives supposed to do? They're not going to go along with it. I think the Republican Party is going to implode, which doesn't bring me any satisfaction because the Dems are more united, even though they hate each other. They're more united in their hatred for conservative Christianity than the Republicans even care. Right? So uh, the Dems will vote as long, they'll vote, you know, they'll vote for Joe Biden's. Uh, Third clone, or you know, the, the robot, whatever that people say, you know, third clone robot. They'll vote for that guy as long as they get their guy in there. Not so much with the conservatives, right? And I believe the Republican Party is just like a few years away until they start throwing money at transgender kids. I'm telling you, they're just a few years away. I never thought that they would ever go for homosexuality, and they did, or abortion, and they, they have for many years. So I think they're almost there. Now, it doesn't bring me any satisfaction in it because I, um, you know, I voted that for, for uh, some time, even as an independent, but I don't see it any other way. I really don't. Yes? Yeah. So there is a need for a third party, but I don't know if there's enough conservative or Christians to unite under a third party. I just don't know. Now, uh, as Christians, of course, we don't believe that political salvation or any sort of thing, but this is where we are, at least in, in our nation. Number three, teacher shortage, education is going to go online, more and more online. Now, the good news is it's going to force parents to really take control of their kids' education, to either homeschool, private school, or charter school. Uh, so more parents are going to take care of that because there's just not going to be enough teachers, and there's going to be uh, like, I don't know, 60 students per class in, in public schools. I mean, you can get a job right now. I'm not saying go get one, but... With a two-year degree and you become a teacher, it usually takes four years because there's such shortage. With a two-year degree, you could become a teacher, maybe in a provisional license and stuff like that. All right. Now, 
if I can finish. AI will be ubiquitous. It will be everywhere. AI will be everywhere, from school to education to finance to police to social media, entertainment. And this is my point. Social media AI influencers. This is Michaela. Michaela is a social media influencer. But she's not a real person. She is an AI-generated image. She doesn't exist. But she has millions of followers. Now, they've said to people, she's not real. They told people she's not real. And uh, people still follow her, right? She was called the like, celebrity of the year or something like that. Phenomenal. Instagram went viral, most influential person on the internet. That's what it was. Most influential person on the internet. Emphasize the person, right? They have this group called the Michaelans, Michaelians, right, to follow her. She's known for her authenticity, she says. That's interesting. Inclusivity, right? And the queen of the metaverse. Come meet her in the, in the metaverse. So totally controllable, right, by the, by the Hollywood and media and all that stuff. But she's go they're going to get so good, they're not going to tell people that there are AIs who they're following. They're not going to tell people that anymore. At some point, they're going to get so good, people are going to follow people online, social media, be influenced by these people. They're not going to be real. They're going to be computer-generated images, and uh, especially in the metaverse, in the metaverse. So if you go into the metaverse, you're going to be influenced, and then maybe we call it influencer. So what's he going to influence kids on? You know, LGBTQ, abortion, all this stuff, be yourself, love yourself, that kind of stuff, right? So um, more viruses. More viruses. Endless. Why? It worked. It did. Uh, because of fear, right? Powered by fear. Powered by fear. It worked. And people are going to do this over and over again, which will lead to digital IDs, more surveillance, medical tyranny. You need this. You need that. You need that. You know how hard we fought for like two and a half years, right? Lost friends, lost family, lots of people hated, people got, you know, got angry, people hated it. And then at the end, don't want to gloat on it, we were right. It was right. I mean, not that we're so like, smart or anything, we just could see it. You could smell it from a mile away. But people, you know, I don't expect an apology or anything like that, or will I get one? But what I'm saying, it was obvious. Things like that are going to continue, and people are going to, I don't want to live through that again, but you know what? It's going to happen. I really do. Patterns, right? Uh, famines and starvation. I'll be talking more of that as we get to the end of the year because I think we are on phase three. Europe and America and Northern America, North America and phase three out of five phases that normally includes, you know, starvation and famine. Early on, phase three. Other parts of the world, early phase four. Other parts of the world, phase five. Phase five is like real starvation. That's Yemen, Lebanon. And the way things are going, you need to really, really be thoughtful and prayerful of what are we going to do as Christians, as family, as a church, uh, when people are really struggling for food. Are we going to step up and help one another? Are we going to be able to love one another and be able to feed one another? Um, or is it easy to just ignore, right? Hebrews 10.25 says, don't do that, right? So it's part of this. It's part of this. And, um, uh, and with that will come migration. When the first world struggles with food and food shortages in the first world, the third world starts. What happens? Migration. Migration. And so we're going to see that into Europe, North America, Canada, the U.S., etc. Um, but I do have one last one. I believe the church, true Christians, will get more serious about their faith. I really do. I really believe the Holy Spirit is really showing Christians that are paying attention what the time of the hour is how serious they need to be. Right? Now, I'm not saying, you know, panic, panic, tomorrow it's over, so, you know, uh, um, you know, tomorrow we die. No, it's saying pay attention. Don't be frightened. Watch what the Lord is showing you. Listen to what the Holy Spirit is saying. And I believe true Christians are going to make Jesus' last command their first priority. What was, what was his last command? And make disciples. Yeah, make disciples. Now, some people just say share the gospel. That's part of it. Don't forget the other part. Make disciples. A lot of Christians just want to go share the gospel, and they forget about the believers that are in the church already that need to be discipled, right? need encouragement. Build up the church and go to the lost, right? Because you can't go to the lost unless you have 
Christians around you. So um, I think Christians will get serious. I really do. I don't say that because I, I predicted it. Jesus said, the gospel of the kingdom will go into the whole world, and then the end will come. It will be as a testimony to all the Gentiles, the nations, and then the end will come. Right? So I do believe Jesus' word will be fulfilled. Prophets, how, people always ask me, how do you think it's going to happen? I really believe under these circumstances, God's people who are listening to the Lord will know the time is right. And we'll get together, we'll begin to pray together, we'll begin to repent together. Right? We've got to do that first, right? Or maybe our obstinance, our stubbornness, our lack of caring, our indifference, and just say, Lord, I'm yours. Use me. And then, then it will go. And they'll be more serious about it, and they'll make it their first priority. Meaning that as you work, that will be your first thing on your mind. As you taking care of your family, as you're going here, as you're going there, it will be part of your priority to disciple and share the gospel. Now, it will include mission work and stuff like that. Absolutely. But it will also mean that as you go in your life, you will be doing that. And I believe that would happen. It's a prophecy. Jesus said it will happen. And this has to happen to you. This has to happen to you. There I am. This better happen to us. To us. So let's pray. Ask the Lord for his help. Because I do believe this is what uh, the Lord wanted us to finish with. Lord, we're so thankful tonight for your word and your truth. Be with us, Lord, by your spirit. And teach us more, Lord, about Jesus. Teach us more, Lord, about his word and his truth. Give us your grace, Lord God. Without it, we could do nothing. And we do pray, Lord, that you would help us in our inability. And perhaps, Lord God, we need to repent of our indifference. And we ask you to help us in that. And Lord, we pray that you would make your command our first priority. We look at the world and we think, boy, it's a mess. But it will continue to be a mess. But Lord, we know that your kingdom is coming. Your kingdom come, your will be done. And Lord, while the world collapses, our world doesn't collapse because it's founded on you. It's built on you, the rock. And it won't fade. It won't crumble. It won't go down. It won't be stolen. It will be solid. It will be a kingdom that cannot be shaken. So we thank you, Lord, for that. Thank you that we belong to that kingdom through, the, through your grace and mercy. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys.